I'm Maliki Fournier. I'm with the Connecticut River Conservancy, and today we're talking about the invasive water chestnut in the Connecticut River watershed. Um, so before we go too far into this presentation, let's talk some important terms. Uh, first of all, invasive species is uh, any organism that is not native to an area and uh, tends to lack a physical element, like a predator. And if left unattended, it can outgrow native organisms or um, take over an area. And then annual versus perennial plants. Um, an annual plant sprouts, grows, and drops seeds, then dies off every year. Whereas a perennial plant, um, the same plant will come back every spring. Okay, so now that we have those out of the way, we can start talking about water chestnut. Um, the European water chestnut is indeed an invasive aquatic annual plant found in the Connecticut River watershed. And it is a fierce competitor uh, in waters less than five meters in depth with soft and muddy bottoms. Um, so a bit about uh, how it works, uh, well, the anatomy of a water chestnut starts at the nut. Uh, from there, the root and stem sprout. Along the stem, you'll find submerged leaves. I like to compare them to um, angel wings uh, that help the plant absorb oxygen underwater. And at the surface, you have uh, the rosette. Um, at the rosette, you'll find the surface leaves with air pockets. These air pockets help the rosette stay afloat, um, as well as little white flowers that eventually turn into new seeds or nuts. Um, from flower, the nut takes approximately a month uh, to grow fully, and they come with uh, four large and very sharp um, spines. These spines protect the seed, but also uh, get untangled in uh, bird feathers, which also help um, spread them. So here is a growing water chestnut that we found this summer. When I train my volunteers, I like to compare these to um, flat strawberry bushes on the surface of the water. You can see these triangular, triangular leaves radiating from the center of, uh, of the flower. And you can actually see two uh, little white flowers that eventually turn into the, uh, the nuts. Mm. So here we have two pictures of water chestnut uh, taken at different times of the season. The one on the left is a water chestnut that was found in June of this year. Um, it's about uh, two inches in diameter. And the picture on the right is a mature water chestnut found in August. As you can see, it's a lot larger, uh, carries more water. It's about 10 inches in diameter. And what's interesting about this one is the small rosette you're seeing next to the large one on that picture on the right actually stems from the same nut. So these two rosettes are together one plant and not two. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, so... How did it get here? Um, it was brought into the Cambridge Ponds in Massachusetts uh, from, the, from Europe as a decorative palm plant back in the 1970s. And from there, it quickly spread. You can now found it, find it in New England, the tri-state area, the Great Lakes, um, and as far south as uh, South Carolina. Um, how do the seeds disperse? Well, there are a few factors that play, uh, play in this role. Um, one of them is wildlife. So seeds will get tangled or carried by um, animals, such as birds or, or beavers. Um, another factor is currents. So most seeds, when they drop from the parent plant, they will usually settle right uh, in that same area. But if the soil at the bottom of the river is disturbed, the currents can uh, push seeds further downstream. And then of course, uh, a major one uh, is boaters and kayakers and canoers uh, who move from water body, from one bo water body to the next, carrying hitchhikers around propellers or inside the boat or even on the trailers. That's why we ask people to be careful when they bring out their boat uh, to move to uh, another portion of the river or in a, another pond. So as I mentioned, uh, water chestnut likes to grow in shallow waters with soft and muddy bottoms. They don't like strong currents. Therefore, they can be found in ponds, coves, lakes, uh, and even hidden under fallen trees or other debris that protect them from, uh, from the current. 
produce. Um, each seed, each nut can produce five to 20 uh, rosettes in one plant. Each rosette can produce up to 20 seeds and each seed is viable for up to 12 years. So you can sort of do the math to figure out how, um, uh, how rep the reproduction rate here. And so let's say uh, year one, you're, you're uh, doing your water chestnut pulls and you forget one rosette. The next year, that one rosette can lead to hundreds of new rosettes. And by year three, we're talking in the thousands, completely covered, covering your cove. Um, which is exactly what happened at uh, uh, This is a site in Holyoke, uh, Lachman Cove. It's 26 acres in size, and water chestnut covers almost 100% of it. Um, it grows in such numbers that rosettes will overcrowd the surface, as you can see here, and it'll, cause, it'll create dense, um, multi-layered mats of water chestnut. Um, and so in a second, I'll just talk about how we, uh, how we treat for, for sites like that. Uh, but first are the impact of water chestnut on our watershed. So obviously there's an ecological impact. These uh, dense floating mats restrict light availability and reduce the oxygen content in the water body. Um, when monoculture, which is um, when it's just one species that is found in the area, when the monoculture growth, it displaces other um, vegetation and degrades wildlife habitat, so it's, it essentially pushes out everything else. Um, and then there's a recreational and economical impact as well. Uh, obviously, it impedes boating, fishing, and swimming, and other recreational activities, and causes financial hardship on um, businesses like marinas and losses in property values for um, uh, riverfront homeowners. So what's our solution to this problem? We have a no seed, no spread approach. Uh, so there isn't much we can do about beds of water chestnut seeds at the bottom of the river. So our approach is to manage uh, current infestation by preventing um, additional uh, seed growth and eventually exhaust the seed supply at the bottom of the river. Um, remember how I said that each seed is viable for 12 years. So again, let's go back to our scenario for getting one rosette um, when we do our work. The, for getting that one rosette will essentially re restart the clock. It will restart the 12 year cycle of us having to go out there and make sure that um, no water chestnut are found. So how, um, oh, and one more thing. Uh, what's important is when, uh, it's important that we detect these new infestations early and we act as quickly as we can. And so if we go back to our comparison of water chestnut in June versus uh, you know, how they grow until August, you can imagine that it's a lot easier for us in June to collect water chestnut that are about two inches in diameter and carry a lot less water than trying to have to cl uh, clear a cove of water chestnut like the one on the picture on the left that carry a lot more water. It can be uh, a lot more labor intensive. So early detection and fast action is the key. So our methods for treating for water chestnut, our favorite is um, hand pulling. We can easily do this from kayaks or canoes. Um, it guarantees 100% removal as long as every square uh, foot of the cove or of, of the area water body is surveyed. Um, it also provides uh, opportunity for community involvement and educational opportunities for constituents. Um, and it's quite inexpensive. I mean, most volunteers already have their boats and um, the supplies are you know, usually minimal, especially if we start earlier in the season. Unfortunately, it's quite labor intensive uh, and not as effective in large areas. And so when, when we find a site like Lock Bon Cove where um, you know, volunteers and supplies just aren't enough, we go to mechanical treatment. And so that, um, I'll, I'll show you guys pictures in a moment, but that is uh, more effective in larger areas and less labor intensive. Unfortunately, it's uh, super expensive. It's slow, full removal is not guaranteed, and it definitely has an impact on non-target species. Uh, same for herbicide treatment, effective in large areas, less labor intensive. What's good about this one is when we treat uh, an area with the herbicide treatment, um, we don't have to take and, and dispose of the plant matter. And so that's a relief on, on uh, you know, 
labor intensity on, on our end. We don't really have to worry about taking the plant matter back with us. Uh, again, it's expensive. Uh, full removal is again, not guaranteed. And it definitely has a huge impact on non-target species, usually where it's applied, it affects everything in that area. Um, so we, we do only, a hand, we do hand pool wherever we can. Um, so here are, are some visuals on what, um, what mechanical and herbicide treatments look like. The picture on the left is, um, the, both of these pictures were taken at Log Pond Cove several years ago. Uh, the picture on the left is machinery that is essentially pulled water chestnuts out of the cove and is disposing them in the dumpster. And the picture on the left is an airboat uh, treating the surface of the water with the herbicide. Um, this other picture on the left is um, machinery that we use today. Um, so this has been used for the last three years. Uh, it's U.S. Fish and Wildlife's Conti Cutter. And it's essentially a motorboat that pushes a um, surface mower on top of uh, at the surface. And the mower goes over the rosettes and essentially like shreds the rosettes as it goes through, um, which is great because it means that we don't have to, again, collect the plant matter and dispose of it later, but it does miss some rosette and disconnects them from the stem and, and cause some uh, you know, rosettes that haven't been destroyed to float downstream. Um, you know, again, this shredding, it destroys the, the rosettes before they're able to form seeds. And then um, this, this fourth picture is again, um, treatment of herbicide that was taken in 2020. Yes, 2020. Um, and it's applied to the water chestnut before they have seeds. Essentially, we, uh, the product that we use is called clear cast, and it doesn't kill the water chestnut, but it stunts its growth. So again, if applied early enough in the season, um, it will stop the water chestnut growth before it's able to produce these seeds. And again, going back to our no seed, no spread approach, this is essentially the idea. Uh, there's nothing much we can do about the infestation at Log Pond Cove for today, but in the future, we can, we can um, reduce the, the seed drop for future years so that work becomes easier. Uh, and the hope is to eventually get to a point where the infestation at Log Pond Cove is minimal enough that it can be managed by uh, volunteers and staff via hand pulling. Um, again, we hand pull where we can on most sites. Um, it's our preferred method. It's fun. We get a lot of volunteers, students, schools, businesses that come help us. Over the years, staff and volunteers have found uh, really creative ways to making the task easier, like the spaghetti pull method, uh, represented here by Cynthia Bettner on the picture on the on the left. Um, and essentially, it's it's just like it sounds, you know, like your fork, uh, your spaghetti on 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 a fork. Um, you grab the rosette with your hand, and you you coil the stem around your hand. And this method um, increases our chances of getting the entire plant out with the root and the seeds. Um, it's important, especially early in the season, to get the entire plant out because they can regrow rosettes. Um, and sometimes even rosettes that have been disconnected from their stem can continue growing to finish uh, making their seeds and dropping them later in the season. So that's why we hand pulling is more effective and um, definitely gets us uh, gives us a chance to collect all the uh, the entire plant when we pull it. The picture on the top right um, is represented is Jeff uh, Bettner, who has tied two shopping. A basket to the top of his canoe and um, as he's putting water chestnut in the baskets the water that comes with this volume of water chestnut is able to drain out as he goes. When we do these hand pulls um, we like to do them on kayaks or canoes. Kayaks are great to get in the shallower tighter areas and canoes are great when you need a partner uh, extra hand and help uh, paddling and you need the boat space to put your water chestnut in. And so, yeah. so does all this work? Absolutely, as long as we get every single rosette out and we come back every year. Um, this is history of water chestnut removed from the Chicopee River in Chicopee, Massachusetts. This data was provided by um, Cynthia Bettner and Chicopee Four Rivers Watershed Association. 
And the work started in 2006. Uh, back then, volunteers pulled tens of thousands of plant matter. And this year, volunteers only had to put, pull out uh, 2,000 pounds, uh, 2, I'm sorry, 200 pounds of um, water chestnut. This is progress. And at this rate, water chestnut can be eradicated from sites like uh, Chick the Chicopee River. Um, with the assumption, obviously, that it's not reintroduced by boaters or wildlife. Sorry. Okay, great. Uh, this is a huge collaborative effort um, with dozens of partners and uh, uh, hundreds of volunteers participating. Uh, federal and state agencies like MADEP, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we have businesses like SWC Environmental Consultants, towns, uh, nonprofits like Friends of Lake Warner, the Connecticut River Conservancy, Chicopee Four Rivers. It's, it's just a huge collaborative effort, um, and everyone uh, does a great job uh, managing water chestnut in the watershed. Uh, what you'll notice from this list is we have First Light Power uh, uh, and um, Holio Gas and Electric, the uh, companies that um, that uh, operate the Turner's Falls Dam and the Holyoke Dam respectively um, in Massachusetts. And so the reason they're on this list is because they also do take part in this work. It's part of their FERC relicensing agreements to participate in restoration efforts, especially in their pools. And so um, they do also participate in this work from funding and providing volunteers and actually going out there themselves and doing the work. So it's great to have them. Um, despite this amazing team, we are still always in need of volunteers. So if you're interested, you can join us next summer. The Falong Towns uh, need help in Massachusetts, and you can bring your kayak or canoe, or reach out if you don't have one and we can accommodate. Um, and this is my contact information. Phone number. I'm most easily reachable via phone number. I'm not great with emails, but try both and you'll get a hold of me somehow. And let me know if you have questions. That's about it. I'm not hearing anyone. Did yeah, Kevin <laughs> muted. I'll I'll let him know. Oh, okay, great. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. I can be heard now. So I'll stop the sharing here. Any okay. questions? And thank you, Aliki. Mm -hmm. No questions? Well, thanks for your help, Aliki, with yes. uh, our collaboration with uh, Friends of Lake Warner has really made a huge difference in us being able to, I think, bring that population under control over the since Cynthia's departure. <clears throat> Certainly having uh, lists of volunteers and being able to distribute um, and publicize pulling information for us has been really helpful and having uh, two trained helpers, you know, is just essential, I think, for us being able to manage our system. There's still a lot of work to do, still a lot of system yeah. upgrades to make, but it's, it's true. Uh, <laughs> it's an organization. Well, <laughs> Michelle, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to okay. thank you and also your. Um, the visual you have of the lower leaves of the water chestnut, I've pulled a lot of water chestnut. I just assumed the feathery leaves were a tangle with some other things. So now I realize yeah. it's actually more water chestnut. But that was very helpful. And it's an excellent presentation for people who have never done this. So I hope you keep um, showing that around. Yeah. When you, when you pull chestnuts from uh, like Lake Warner, it, it's really murky and there's a lot of stuff that comes up with it. It's hard to tell, but I found a, uh, a pretty good sized patch in, uh, what is it, Magnolia Pond off the Connecticut River, where mm. the water was a lot more clear. There wasn't other, and there you could see the angel feathers. And I'm like, oh, this is part of the plant. I thought it was part, just like mm. Michelle was saying, of something else. 